And you're allowed to swear. I'm gonna establish that rule now. Okay. Yeah. And if you don't like it, fuck you! Here I go with the fuck yous again. I gotta stop that. You gotta have me saying all these fuck yous on camera. I'm gonna look like a real bitter asshole. This is a prop from the Smashing Pumpkins video, Tonight Tonight. This is the spaceship that they go to the moon on. This is the, whoa. Word painting, fucking A. Cheerio sculpture, F.U. shack. Palm tree frond that looks like a woman's crotch. This is Peter Gabriel big time video from 87. This thing is in a very fragile state now. It's been a long, wild ride for me. You know, everybody's like, choose one thing and do it well, my son. I'll go. And I was like, fuck that, you know? I want to try everything I can. I'm Tyler Knowles, and I'm here today with Neil Berkeley, the director of Beauty is Embarrassing, uh, and also Wayne White, the film star. How's it feel to be a film star now, a movie star, Wayne? Oh, no, I'm not a movie star. I'm just the subject of a documentary. <laughs> And it feels great, you know. It's a it's a good film, and it's it's great to have your story told. Everybody wants their story told, some form or another. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have mine told through the through cinema, one of the most effective ways to the human heart. And we're here in Wayne's home and studio, which uh, is featured, of course, in the film, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. This humble room is my studio. For the last 12 years, this is where I've done just about everything. It's not a Hollywood set. This is actually the studio where the work gets done. Uh, I was able to catch a, a press screening of Beauty is Embarrassing, and sitting in a room with a bunch of critics and press people, having them laugh from the belly was pretty, pretty refreshing and pretty amazing. And I think that proves that it's definitely a funny film. That's good to hear. But I think also, <laughs> and maybe even more importantly, uh, the film is inspirational and it's motivational. I know I've seen the trailer for it now probably 20 times and it, it honestly never gets old. I suppose maybe a testament to the film is that I think after people watch this they may make some changes in their lives. So that's my feeling on it. Well, well I mean I, you know I, I hope so. That'd be good. You know and it's, it's rare for a doc to give someone that kind of warm glow you know and you don't I don't know if you can set out to uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna inspire people, or Wayne, you're gonna be inspirational, and let's go do that. I don't know if you can do that, but we did want it to be funny. We, we did want it to be fun, and there are some some darker moments. But I did want it to be joyful, and I talk about that before I show it to people at screenings. I did want it to be this joyful celebration of art and effort and love and these all these great things. So I'm really, it's really exciting that people are reacting. And to hear that a bunch of critics uh, reacted that way, yeah, that's good. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> if the reviews reflect it, well, I'll be happy. <laughs> Damn it, it left for an hour and a half. <laughs> One star. Yeah. So, Neil and Wayne, uh, your relationship, it goes back some 10 plus years, I was reading. Um, I understand that you were getting together over lunch a few years back or kind of throughout those 10 years. Uh, and that, Neil, you presented Wayne with the idea of making a film on Wayne's life. Um, he wasn't totally on board at first though. Tell us about the beginnings of this project and how did you get him to get on board? It's funny to think back on that because we were, I, I moved in the neighborhood and I moved to business. I have a design company in Los Feliz here in Hollywood. And I live a few blocks down the road and we would see each other around town all the time. And when we started, we, we knew who each other was. We were just barely acquaintances. We weren't like buds or anything. and. Um, I would, we would start to go to lunch and we'd have pizza and, and the book had just come out and he was in Esquire magazine and all these things like his career was heating up like the, the word paintings were blowing up and traveling the world so he was already a commodity and I was like you know it's time to you should, we should do something I've got this company we can design we can animate your work and um, I uh, said let's let's make a documentary and at first he would stand off and yeah. not I didn't think it was a great, good idea I mean I didn't think it was I was, it was interesting enough for a documentary. Plus, I was a little wary of being uh, exploited, you know, in some kind of way. Because most documentaries kind of look for drama or tragedy or some kind of dark underpinning for their dramatic structure to give it interest, you know. And I thought, no, he's going to try to dig up something or, 
or make me look bad or you know that's I, the nature I, of documentaries I, I right. felt suddenly vulnerable and not really not not worthy you know it's like yeah I don't know nobody you know I, I never thought of myself as a subject of a documentary but and so it took like two or three lunches and he always says that the thing that that triggered it was the vision of a movie coming out or you know being in south by southwest and so finally having so, a room full of people watching me you know <laughs> i need the attention badly so my my ego won out i guess yeah but i had no idea he was going to pull it off he'd never made a documentary before and he tried to get other people interested in directing it, and he would sort of produce it, and they didn't want to do it because they thought it wouldn't be a good idea either. And that cinched it for me. I thought, okay, forget it. And I went down to Houston to build my giant George Jones head at Rice University. Lo and behold, he shows up with a camera. And I'm like, okay, let's play like we're making a documentary. You play like you're a documentary filmmaker, and I'll play like I'm the great subject. Okay, roll. I was just kind of like humoring him. And then, lo and behold, eight weeks later, he had enough footage that uh, he started shopping it around town, showing people, and he started attracting all this top talent to help, and and the ball started rolling, and here we are, through, almost three years later, and it's a reality. He's a hard-working motherfucker. He's got, like, Southern work ethic ground into him hard. Now everyone will know of my sufferings. This is what happens when you get all proud of yourself and you're polishing your Emmy. <laughs> oh, my Emmy. Oh, I need him to read me. And they gave me one. I can't throw anything away. Every piece of wood I cut is an interesting shape to me. I just, I'm, I immediately fall in love with scraps and junk. This is what makes me happy, a pile of garbage. Neil, this is your your debut as a director, as a feature film director. Um, and it's a strong debut, I have to say. How did you go about telling the story of Wayne White in just one film? Can you share how you planned the shooting and the telling of the story, and maybe any surprises that you had while you were making it? It was all a surprise. I mean, I knew his resume inside and out. From, so from a professional standpoint, I knew exactly what the story was. I knew all the beats from college to, to today, because I was a fan of his work before I even knew who he was. Um, but honestly, I knew very little about his personal life until I started shooting. That's, that's actually when, when I started shooting, I, I learned about his dad and I learned about Mike Quinn all these, these are all stories from the movie. And I learned about these relationships with his mom and things that happened in their lives and him and Mimi and the kids and the personal stuff I learned as I shot. I mean, we came here very early on and we sat in this room for five days, every morning for five days we would shoot. And I just interviewed him and said, just asked him all these questions. And that's where I learned all the, all the stories. Um, and then even as we shot, I mean, even a year into it, I was finding stuff out that I didn't even know. Like, you know, one day I walked in and he had this big box of tapes and he said, oh, by the way, I carried a video ca camera around in the eighties. There's probably some peewees and stuff. And it was all this 50 hours of gold, you know, mm -hmm. all these behind the scenes of peewees that no one had ever seen and home movies of, of him and the kids. And it was amazing. And then, you know, one day he starts playing the banjo and singing this Blue Ridge Mountain song. And I'd never heard him sing it. He just did it suddenly. And that became the backbone for one of the, my favorite scenes in the movie. You know, and Mrs. Stoddard. So, yeah, it was a, a process. Um, and a lot of it was just sort of trying to figure it out and find the story. Um, and a great thing to have, Chris Bradley showed up. Chris Bradley's a producer and editor, a director in his own right. And he had he's done this several times. So he came in and said, okay, you've got something good here. And he sort of honed it and really shaped everything and really brought he brought a professional focus to it that, it that it really needed but it was always just me and him um very small there weren't lights or sound or anything like that it was a very small ragtag crew but and it grew organically there yeah. was no real pre-plan yeah. to it no we just kind of like made it up as we went along and and the ideas came as we went along there was no outline there's no real agenda that i had these well-known projects that I worked on, and that was a draw. But other than that, the personal stuff just kind of came out as... And I also learned that, you know, to, as it went along, I got a little more trusting and a little more open and started to reveal things. Yeah, I mean, so, so the, in short, you know, the, the professional thing, I knew what it was. I knew that story, yeah. how to tell it, or what we were going to tell. The personal, that was like peeling layers on an onion, you know, just every day finding out something new. And crying. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I would have a little nugget that I needed, and I'd call up and say, what are you doing there? Are you painting today? 
okay, I'm going to shoot you painting. But as we would sit there, I'd say, so tell me about this thing you mentioned a couple weeks ago, you know, and that's kind of how we tricky. Pulled, yeah, that's how we pulled back the, the layers. And Wayne, when you do your art, this is just a personal curiosity of mine. Are you inspired just randomly at random moments of the day or the night? Or, or do you kind of plan like today, I just need to create something? How does it work for you? Well, it can be either. Sometimes it's random. Ideas are never dormant. You know, I mean, ideas are dormant. You have to kind of like uh, stir them up, you know. They can hit you like anybody who's created something. You're, it's surprising when an idea comes. But I structure my work day. I come, I live upstairs. This is the basement of my house and this is the studio. I come down here in the morning and I make myself work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to make myself uh, and sometimes I'm eager to do it, you know, but uh, I don't really believe in like creative blocks or, you know, I don't believe in that. You, you got to, you just got to do it. You got to yeah. make yourself do it. So I structure the fact that when I'm in this room, it's go time, you know, so, but ideas come in all, in all times. All times, sure. Yeah. Over the summer, you guys took to Kickstarter and you had a successful campaign in a month, you raised just over your $50,000 goal so that you could uh, self-distribute Beauty is Embarrassing. Can you speak to the power of something like Kickstarter to your project, and why did you choose to go this route? Well, I mean, I, I, at first it felt like vanity wanting to be in theaters <laughs> because we, we have very good distribution partners. We're going to be on PBS Independent Lens in January. Uh, DocuRama is going to put the movie out on DVD and Time Warner, VOD. So every other channel is taken care of in a very big, real way. So that was exciting. That was like, you know, validating. But we did want to be in theaters because we feel like that, you know, the experience you were talking about, those critics, that's that's how you should see this movie with a group. You should feel that energy, hear that laughter, because it's a really special thing. And I wanted people to feel that. And the people that saw it at festivals and saw it, you know, our friends and family, they, they all agreed. And so we put up a really strong Kickstarter page, and it and it came through in a big, big way because we couldn't have done this. And now we're in you know almost thirty cities and gonna roll out the rest of the year. So it's just, just I think Kickstarter is a pretty powerful thing. I think it's gonna change a lot. I think it's gonna really have an amazing effect on especially small independent film. Um, but for us, yeah, it allowed us to be in theaters, and that's something that I wanted to do since South by Southwest. These are drawings from the first season of PB's Playhouse, wallpaper designs. This was right by the front door. I designed most of the puppets on the show. This is Cool Cat. Here's my man, Dirty Dog. Hey, Pee Wee, what do you say? I'm smoking cigarettes nearly every day. I wanted him to have this butt hanging out of his mouth, but they wouldn't let us. It's a kid's show. One of the shows that I actually could watch growing up was Pee Wee's Playhouse. So I grew up, I was lucky enough to be a child in the 80s growing up with Pee Wee's Playhouse. And I know, Neil, you grew up with a lot of, of uh, Wayne's work, not just Pee Wee's Playhouse, but some of the other stuff too, the music videos. So, Wayne, how does it feel now to meet adults whose minds you imprinted when they were kids? <laughs> oh, it's, it's always a pleasure. And I've met many, many people, mostly the generation now, they're in their 30s that were kids and that watched Pee Wee. And they're all very appreciative. It's a great payback, you know. It's a great payoff or whatever. Uh, it's uh, it's wonderful, you know. The fact that uh, people, uh, you 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 affected people's lives, you know. That's something I never thought of, you know. While we were doing it, we were in the moment making it for ourselves. We were entertaining ourselves when we made PB's Playhouse. We never once thought of a, a giant generation of people being influenced. But here they are, you know. One one reaction I get consistently is, man, Flory scared the shit out of me as a kid. <laughs> Flory, oh, man, oh, Flory. Everybody was afraid of Flory. But, uh, and everybody loves Randy. And gosh, it's, I mean, who wouldn't love that reaction, you know? It's great. I, I find that there's something validating about having liked, having been a fan at 10 years old. Because yeah. you look around, you go, oh, the cool kids like this thing that I thought was funny. You're like, oh, I, I understood it and I got it. So I must be, you know, there's something in my mind, like I said, validating about being having grown up on Pee Wee's Playhouse. And then, you know, Beekman's World. I was a huge Beekman's yeah. World fan. So, yeah, it seems like you're kind of in the club. It's a big, big, gigantic club, but it does make you feel like, you know, you, you, you get what, what these people get.
And I love the sequences from the film that follow Pee Wee's Playhouse and, you know, the little secret puppet shows that you guys are putting on yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah, the flock so, box. Yeah. Looking ahead for when this film comes out uh, and is available on home video or for the home viewing experience. Well, there'll be some outtakes and maybe some extra bonus features, some of those puppet shows maybe in full length. Yeah, Can there's going to be, th there's not really a full length, ver he used to edit in camera. <laughs> it was really hard to edit that footage because he was sort of avant-garde in his approach to filmmaking. Yeah, I uh, did my own little cuts. Then. Yeah, some of those shots are maybe seven frames. I mean, there's uh -huh. a lot of stuff like that, but they'll be, they'll definitely be, the special features are going to be pretty impressive on this DVD. I can't Absolutely. wait. Yeah. So throughout Beauty is Embarrassing, Wayne is giving this presentation to a group of people. I guess the presentation sort of serves as a guide for the story throughout the movie. Uh, Neil, is this something that you had Wayne do uh, intentionally to kind of keep the story going? Or is this just something that happened and then you use it throughout through the editing to make it uh, tell the story? Uh, yeah, I mean, I helped it evolve. Uh -huh. He inspired that stage show. Yeah. It, it was originally just a rambling artist slide talk that all artists give at universities and stuff. And he had shot a couple of those, and he suggested, you know, tighten this thing up, you know, bring in more autobiographical stuff. And he inspired me to create this hour-long monologue that was scripted, rehearsed, brought in puppets and banjo, and made it more of a piece of theater than just a uh, artist lecture. Yeah, I mean, as soon not, I mean, after seeing it several times, it's, I started to realize it'd be cool if he, because he's so great on stage and so, you know, magnetic that way. I thought oh, it'd be cool if you like narrated your own story. We'll use you as the backbone to get us from, you know, thing to thing. And then he was doing things. So yeah, he added like the story, some of his parents and his kids and, and Mimi. And uh, eventually he was like, well, if we're going to do it, let's do it. So we, you know, got, he got the suit on. We booked him at the Sound Theater here in LA or Cine Family. And then uh, I sent a, an eight minute uh, teaser to Mark Flanagan, who owns Largo, this really amazing club where like Sarah Silverman and Zach Galifianakis all came out of. And he called me within 30 minutes and said, I love Wayne. I want to book you four nights in February. Let's do it. So that's where we shot most of those of those moments. But it is. It's a really interesting, like, people always ask about that. Like, what is that? Where does that come from? And he still does it today. I mean, he's doing it next week in New York. So yeah, it's still something people can go see. Well, then your production company did the animated sequences, most of those, correct? Yeah. That, and that I also helped to kind of drive things along and tell the story. Yeah, I own a motion graphics company. And that's kind of the... the catalyst for all of this is I, you know, his work looks like it's about to jump off the page. So I was like, well, I have a new company. If I animate this stuff, I can show it off. So that was the original idea is to animate the work and just kind of do something I can show off my company, a short film maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and it went from there. But yeah, we did the opening credits. We did the Mimi Pong cartoon, the end credits, all the animation throughout the movie. Uh, the end credits were actually art directed by Wayne. Uh, he drew most of those characters, all the characters through a lot of the scenes, the sky, art directed, got all the textures and colors right. Um, but yeah, my company did all that. Yeah, they're great. So Wayne, you grew up in Tennessee. Yeah. You lived in New York City for a little while, and now Los Angeles is your home. I'm curious where you feel the most at home, or I guess uh, if, if none of these places really feel like home, if you think that an artist can even have a home. Well, I, was, I felt at home in all three places, you know, Tennessee, Manhattan, and L.A. Um, and I think it's important for an artist to, to live in different worlds. It's very important to get out of your comfort zone and go somewhere where the culture is foreign to you. I think it sharpens your mind. It opens your eyes. Uh, it, it opens your mind, too, to, you know, you get rid of a lot of preconceptions and prejudices. And you, you're a lot less provincial. All the stuff that makes for a bad artist, you know, provincialism and prejudice and blinders and misunderstandings uh, the artist needs to um, to explore the world that's what artists are for is to uh, bring fresh eyes to the world and move and living in different worlds gives you fresh eyes and it's uh, it's it's painful you know to uproot yourself um, I know the feeling but um, art is painful <laughs> Art is not easy, my friends. Uh, it it pay, you have to pay a price to be a good artist, and uh, but I've I've made myself um, feel comfortable in all three worlds. I've appreciated all three, and I think that makes me somewhat unique. You know, a lot of people never leave their 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 familiar worlds. So, 
I've been at home in all three. I've been trying to make beauty my whole life. If this can work, there's hope for us all. I want to try everything I can. You know, I want to take this painting idea and see if you can do a puppet version of it. I want to take the cartooning and turn it into a set. I want to take the set and turn it back into a painting. That's a true pioneer. That's a person who is never satisfied, always wants to know, how do I understand myself more? Neil and Wayne, it's been a pleasure. Your movie, Beauty is Embarrassing, is fantastic. Thank and you. I hope that it will get the respect that it so richly deserves. Oh, we do too. Thank you. Thank you very much.